Hello friends, good morning and welcome to another day of Bio News. Today I have about 10 papers to go through with you and they're quite interesting. To begin we have a paper by Weitz or Weitz et al. This paper found that they found an interesting relationship between GABA and the reward effects of cocaine in the brain. It found that Number one, uh, administering cocaine to rodents reduced the postsynaptic GABAergic inhibitory currents uh, in the um, rodents' brains. So, taking cocaine, a dopaminergic drug that inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and causes dopamine transmission and noradrenaline transmission, with noradrenaline is norepinephrine, it's like adrenaline in the brain, think of it like, you know, speed in the brain. Um, it causes those things to be released and causes their, in, I can talk about in uh, reuptake inhibition in a, in a future episode, but basically it increases these excitable things in the brain. And naturally you would think by doing that it would reduce the inhibitory stuff in the brain. So we know that. The interesting thing also though is increasing the inhibitory activity in the brain, the GABAergic activity, also reduces even the reward potential of cocaine by limiting that dopaminergic effect. Natural but interesting to note. Uh, Molodini et al. Uh, produced a paper in which they studied um, in humans the effect of supplementation with one species of bacteria and one prebi prebiotic. They compared supplementing the, the bacteria by itself or with the prebiotic and they did this specifically in people with coronary artery disease. And what they found was this, and by the way, the species is called the Lactobacillus rhamnosus G, which is a very common species you can find online on Amazon if you'd like. And the prebiotic is called inulin. Inulin was significantly uh, synergistic when added with uh, the uh, bacteria, uh, bacteria. Not synergistic, uh, I didn't mean that. I meant it added more value. I'm not sure if it was synergistic. Um, because we can't read the full paper yet. But what it did do was reduce C-reactive protein, which is a measure of, C of systemic inflammation. It's a protein released by the liver, which is a good thing. It reduced tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is an inflammatory cytokine released by the immune system when it thinks it's being damaged or attacked, which often happens in coronary artery disease. And it reduced imagined subjective scores of depression and anxiety among the human patients that had the disease significantly. Just the addition of the um, uh, bacteria with the uh, prebiotic. Uh, so, fantastic paper. Very interesting. Highly recommend reading it. I will certainly be reading it in detail when it's out myself. A paper by Turner et al. Very interesting. Studying worldwide. Actually, I think this was, um, this was in the West. Americans, yeah, yeah. Studying America, there have been a lot of worldwide uh, surveys of depression and anxiety and COVID. I, apparently, I wasn't aware of them. This is the first one I'm reading. Uh, but this was in the US, and the results follow through with some in China and in other places in the world. What they found was the most susceptible people to depression and anxiety from the change in the living situation that we have are women, and specifically young women. Which explains why I've been noticing that Lucy has been suffering, my wife has been suffering a lot with this uh, situation. And unfortunately, you know, she's pregnant, so this really affects, I'm, I'm very concerned because it, it really affects the baby, you know, the, the mentality of the mother really affects the baby. And women, I think, are quite susceptible. Young, uh, younger women are, apparently, according to this paper, the most susceptible. In fact, the average uh, rates of <laughs> generalized anxiety disorder, according to these surveys online, from papers, from psychiatrists, are 30% in the worldwide population, both of generalized anxiety disorder and major depressive disorder. That's really, really high. That is an epidemic of mental health. And I knew this was happening, but I didn't read any papers about it. It's so interesting to see it confirmed. Another paper by Sperney et al. Uh, this paper studied uh, the effects of the use of an SSRI called escitalopram, which by the way is uh, an SSRI I don't like at all, but it's very clean. It's not the worst SSRI. There are very bad ones. There are some that antagonize sigma receptors like sertraline, which is ridiculous because the sigma receptor, if you antagonize it, you reduce dopaminergic function further. You wouldn't want to do that unless you have like bipolar disorder or something like that. Anyway, so there are a bunch of SSRIs, but this one studies 10 milligrams of escitalopram. And what they're trying to see is, in humans, by the way, and, and what they're trying to see is this, 66 people. They're trying to find out was, because SSRIs do this, right? They inhibit the reuptake of serotonin in the brain. What does that mean? You have, but let me, let's talk about inhibition of reuptake. You have two cells in your brain. These are called neurons. They have hormones that they secrete, send to each other to tell the other cell to do something. This hormone goes and this other cell may have a receptor for that hormone or it may not. 
If it doesn't, it's not going to recognize the signal. If it does, like a, it may have a GABA receptor or a glutamate receptor. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, slows the other one down. Uh, glutamate excites it. Uh, it'll have a receptor and it'll feel it. Now, what does a reuptake inhibitor drug do? It lets your first neuron signal that, that hormone. It doesn't tell your brain to release more of the hormone necessarily. Like cocaine inhibits reuptake, but also causes your brain to release hormones. And SSRI is selective to serotonin and it does not cause a transmission of serotonin. Some of them relative drugs do, but this one doesn't. So what does an SSRI do? It tells that second cell, don't let go of the hormone because your body doesn't feel serotonin that well. So you need to feel it a little bit more like me. So what does your, tell your body? Hold that serotonin, hold it. So that's what a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor does. It makes you feel serotonin a bit more. And the reason it works is because when it does that, just like psilocybin and LSD do, that's why people microdose them, it downstream to that, that effect causes an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor in your brain, which is a growth factor. And that provides an antidepressant, anti-inflammatory, anti-anxiolytic, uh, which is anti-anxiety effect in your brain. But SSRIs also do something else. People will notice that at medium and even higher doses of SSRIs, they will feel more inhibition. They're not taking a benzo, they're not taking Valium or Xanax, but it doesn't feel like that. But you're a little bit more inhibited. Look at my older videos, for example, and compare them to right now, the speed of uh, speech that I have, for example. You're a little bit more inhibited. The question is, is that because serotonin downstream, in inhibition of reuptake of serotonin downstream causes an increase in GABAergic activity? Or does it inhibit excitatory activity like glutamate? Well, basically, this per paper by Sperny et al. showed, maybe I'll go into a bit of details. Basically, it showed no evidence of GABAergic increases, but evidence of glutamate decreases, glutamate excitatory uh, function decreases. Specifically, it showed a reduction in hippocampal, but not thalamic, like your thalam hypothalamus, glutamate activity. Previous papers had shown a decrease in glutamate activity in the prefrontal cortex in the first week, but, uh, and, and I don't know if they showed a, de a decrease in the occ occipital uh, uh, cortex. I, uh, my note actually has a mistake here, so I can't tell. But anyway, the problem is these papers, you know, you can't read them yet. They're very new. So that's why I just give you guys brief things about them. Um, a paper by Wooler et al. showed that both dopamine 1 and dopamine 2 receptors both play a role in attention in the brain. Of course, as you guys know, most of the drugs prescribed to people who have attention problems are dopaminergic drugs. They try to make them less addictive by making them slightly less dopaminergic, but those ones are actually worse drugs, usually like methylphenidate and these kind of drugs. But it turns out both receptors are important. This is something important uh, to note because some people sometimes use dopamine agonists, something, sometimes people use antipsychotics that block one receptor and not the other. So it's important to note that both of them are important in memory. Uh, Otani et al. have a oh, very interesting paper. This is a mouse model of a disease called autoimmune glomerulonephritis, which is what autoimmune kidney disease, which potentially, I'm not sure, could be what Chris Bumstead has, I have to ask, but uh, potentially that could be what he has. His autoimmune system I've heard is attacking his kidneys. So in this mouse model, rodent model, I don't know, yeah, mouse model, they showed that castrating the mice, uh, not, going, not taking a mice from super physiologic levels of androgens, Taking a mouse from normal male levels of androgens to zero by castrating it reduced the glomeruli, uh, glomerosclerotic severity. Which glomerosclerotic means when the glomeruli in the kidney start to break and develop scar tissue around them. So it reduced the severity of that, indicating that even physiologic levels of androgens worsen the severity of the autoimmune sort of kidney disease. Uh, which is interesting because I was thinking that it did it most, mostly through growing the kidney, but it actually does it also through the autoimmune uh, disease, which is fascinating. A paper by Yang et al. Very interesting. So it studies Akibia saponin D. This, uh, this phytochemical benefits metabolic diseases. It's been shown in various studies, including obesity, atherosclerosis, and NAFLD. But it's only 0.13% bioavailable orally. So how does it do that? So that's what the authors were questioning and they thought that maybe it does that by changing the microbiome. So they performed a study and what they found out was 
ASD, this is uh, Akibia saponin D, ASD altered the microbiome promoting these species, uh, Butrisimonas, Ruminococcus, Bifidobacterium, Allostipes, and Prevetola. The last two, Allostipes and Prevetola, may promote inflammation and metabolic syndrome. They may not be great. But the first two, Butrisimonas and Ruminococcus, both convert gl um, glucose into the fatty acid butyrate, which you guys have heard of from me before if you've seen my video called Sodium Butyrate Changing 2% of Your Genes with a Supplement. That is a uh, histone deacetylase inhibiting fatty acid, short chain fatty acid that is produced by the microbiome. And it provides energy to the microbiome and lowers the local pH. Ah, now we get onto this pH subject that we're discussing with Jerry Brainham. Local pH in the gut reducing the growth of pathologic bacteria that grow in apparently different uh, uh, higher pH levels. Um, Bifidobacterium preserves gut barrier functions. What is gut barrier functions? Your, your intestinal lining has a mucosal lining on the inside and that prevents your bacteria from harming your actual intestines and more specifically from your body thinking your bacteria is attacking you from the inside and sending inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha to attack your intestines like what happened to me when I got Crohn's disease. So, and then this is why it's so important to study these species of bacteria and why I'm so, I have such a specific uh, regimen with my probiotic supplements and why I'm always keeping track of this. So, um, Anyway, then conclusion is that ASD may promote, may um, uh, attenuate metabolic syndrome by improving the health of the microbiome. Uh, Agnello et al. And by the way, I'd like to, you guys to know this microbiome studies, it's all in its infancy. We're going to learn so much in the next 10 years. It's such an exciting time period to be interested in this. Uh, Agnello et al. Um, have a paper on tau in ALS. So if you guys don't know, in Alzheimer's disease, there's two main pathologies in the brain that cause the actual oxidative stress and damage in the brain that causes the neuronal cell loss that eventually causes the dementia that causes what you see as Alzheimer's where they can't remember things. But there's actually two pathologies in their brain. For example, in Parkinson's disease, there's something called alpha sinoprotein, uh, sino something like sino sy something like that. That's a kind of protein that they pathologically deposit in their brain that causes damage. In Alzheimer's disease, they have two kinds. One is called beta amyloid plaques. These are made from, well, well, we'll actually get into them later, beta amyloid plaques, and then they have something called, that, those are extracellular. Then they have intracellular, what are called tau tangles. Now, tau is a protein that is produced in all people. What they found in this study is that, and by the way, when tau is hyperphosphorylated, it can turn into this insoluble aggregate that I call the, uh, intra, uh, what's it called, a neurofibrillary tangle the neurofibrillary tau tangle. But anyway, the interesting thing about it is this. They discovered that ALS patients, my grandmother died of ALS a year and a half ago. Stephen Hawking died of ALS. You guys are probably familiar with that uh, famous disease. ALS, by the way, guys, if you'd like to know more about that disease, I studied it a lot myself. It's a disease in which, very interesting. So your brain has something called axons. Axons are like these, like, uh, I always call them tent tentacles because I'm, you know, I never studied biology in school. By the way, I did study science, just to make clear, because some people keep commenting that I didn't study science. No, I studied science, but I didn't study biology. So I, anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. So it's, it, they look like tentacles in the brain and they send neurotransmitters through the brain. These axons are covered in what's called myelin, which is a lipid rich sheath that increases the capacity of these axons to function. Not only increases, it's necessary structurally for their function. In the, in the disease of ALS, these my, myelin, the myelin production reduces and these axons degenerate. Eventually, the person loses control of their body. Now, a um, couple of notes on this. Number one, my grandmother died of it, so I'm very concerned about it. Number two, progesterone signaling at the progesterone receptor is one of the best ways to increase the speed of myelin production synthesis in the body, which is one of the reasons I tell everybody that's on TRT to be on HCG. Because your balls, your, sorry, your gonads are what produce your progesterone, mostly. And you need progesterone. And people like me, I mean, I have HCG now. I'm thinking of going on it. I haven't taken the plunge yet. But if I go on HCG, I will immediately begin supplementing progesterone. The only reason I'm not is because it's a negative feedback signal to the hypothalamus and the produce, production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So, but, but progesterone signaling increases the 
rate of myelin synthesis. In fact, by the way, the only, while we're on this topic, the only, be careful, don't use a synthetic progestogen. You see, in Europe, they give women micronized progesterone as a uh, contraceptive, but in the US, they give them progestogens. And progestogens are all associated with cancer development, except for one called segesterone acetate which unfortunately you can only really find in Brazil for some reason when it's not with estrogen or with something else. Anyway, the point is, um, in, in the disease of ALS, what they found is that, uh, this was really an off topic, but I hope this was helpful. They found that ALS patients had higher levels of total tau proteins in their CNS and had lower phosphorylated tau to total tau ratios, showing that it could be used as a biomarker for ALS. In a paper by He et al., uh, they studied the anti-epileptic drug zo zonisamide. I don't know how to pronounce it, zonisamide. You guys may be familiar with anti-epileptic drugs if, if some of you have had consultations with me. They're some of my favorite medications for people who have inhibitory problems in their body that don't want to take SSRIs uh, because they're not usually as addictive or as uh, concerning as GABA receptor modulators. But these things often either increase GABA in the brain in total, like some of my clients are on sodium valproate, for example, or they for like this drug, for example, decrease, like this drug decreases basically glutamate, glutamatergic activity, excitatory activity. For example, here it inhibits voltage dependent sodium and calcium channels, uh, decreasing the likelihood of action, potential generation and stuff like that and spontaneous firing and so on in the brain. Because it does that, it produces an anti-apoptotic effect in the brain. It preserves mitochondrial function of dopaminergic neurons. It uh, has an antioxidant effect. It increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, neurotrophic receptor kinase 2 expression. And it does this, of course, by reducing the overall excitatory activity in the brain. The more excitement you have in your body, the more oxidative stress you have. The more you go on marathons, the more damage you're causing to your body. It's the same in your brain. So if you just sl slightly increase what we call in neuroscience, it's the excitatory to inhibitory ratio, the E to, e, uh, the e to I ratio. If you increase, decrease the E to I ratio, you can preserve some brain function. So in this study, they used uh, zonisamide uh, on, um, to, to, to show that they could inhibit glucose and oxygen dependent apoptosis and ameliorate neurological deficits and reduce infarct volumes in a rodent model of ischemia, where you, ischemia is like a stroke in a rodent uh, model. Um, and finally, uh, a paper by Lee et al. And this paper is a review paper. As I told you guys before, I will not cover review papers very often, but this one is nice. This paper just summarizes phytochemicals that have been shown in other papers to reduce the synthesis of the precursor or the pathways to amyloid beta synthesis, uh, um, amyloid precursor protein synthesis, which is APP, which is the protein that is then used to produce amyloid plaques in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. Remember, they have tau and amyloid. Anyway, so I just want to list these two uh, to you guys really quickly. There's two pathways. There's a secretase dependent pathway and a structure dependent pathway. The structure dependent pathway, resveratrol has been shown to do this. Br Brazilin from sapan wood has been shown to do this. Curcumin, tannic acid from oak, and theaflavin from black tea. The secretase dependent pathway, ligustilide has been shown to do this. Gins ginsenoside from ginseng has been shown to do this. TDC from licorice root has been shown to do this. By the way, I take licorice root, I take ginseng, I take resveratrol, I take curcumin, I take tannic acid, I take theaflavin, just to let you guys know. And then, the, and then we'll just continue the list for secret days. Hispidin, I don't take that. I take berberine, I take EGCG, and then they include uh, polymethoxyflavones from citrus peels and black ginger. So guys, that's my summary for BioNews 4. I'll see you guys soon. Hope I wasn't too boring. You know, maybe maybe not everything can be followed, but hopefully some, some stuff is interesting. I'm a little bit all over the place. That's just how I am with, uh, with stuff. I like to talk and go on tangents. Hope you guys are patient with me. See you guys soon. Have a great day.